So our expectations, I mean, we're hearing uh, a lot about inflation, are becoming more realistic, perhaps. I mean, it was interesting just then to hear Hamish talking about the benefits of inflation, but the implications for investors uh, surely are going to be game changing. So there is so much to discuss now around what's going to happen, the various challenges, the opportunities as well of investing in fixed income in the inflationary environment. And I'm pleased to say that Natasha Page is with us now for our next panel. Natasha. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. And welcome everyone to our uh, global media conference at Janice Hansen. Um, so this panel will discuss the opportunities and challenges of investing in fixed income, particularly in an inflationary environment. Um, and our panel to discuss these issues, uh, let me introduce them. They are, so from our global bonds team, portfolio managers, uh, Jason England and Bethany Payne and from our credit team, our portfolio manager, Seth Mayer. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so to set the scene, um, Bethany and Jason, um, could you outline um, how you see the current inflationary environment? What has caused this and what are the current implications of this environment? Jason, um, may I start with you? Um, mm -hmm. It has just been announced that inflation has risen seven and a half percent in the US. Why is this happening and what are the implications? Yeah, sure. So obviously, yeah, it's uh, pretty topical right now with the print we saw reaching uh, a four decade. You know, you have to go back to the 1980s to see a print this high at seven and a half percent. Obviously, it's, it's, it went from seven percent last month. You're seeing that you know the Fed for so long stuck to that transitory narrative that these base effects would roll off and we'd start to see inflation moderate. Obviously, they they, they lost that term or, or got rid of that term at the end of last year, realizing that it was much stickier. And these supply bottlenecks that you're seeing, a mismatch between supply and demand that happened when we shut down during the pandemic and you saw a lot of these um, supply chains really, you know, have a hard time starting back up. And you see that is as they started up, then you'd get the Delta variant and then later the Omicron. So they, they, they're they very slow to come back. You saw it in semiconductors very early last year. So you saw a surge in you know, new and used car prices. So you really saw the, the narrative now where these are much stickier. And today's you know number was really broad based. It, you know, it was across energy, it was across food, it was across rent. And then there were some surprises out there today that was a little bit alarming that you saw medical services now and devices that were really, you know, really spiked. So now you're starting to see is, is it really going to, have we reached a peak yet? I think that was really what people were thinking today. We would get maybe the peak in, in February and we'd start to see some moderation. The Fed still thinks that, you know, their PCE number that they look at is at 4.9%. We'll get a new one in, in late February, but they think it's going to trend down to 2.7% later this year. But there's a long way to go from you know 4.9 down to 2.7. So un unless we start getting some of these supply bottlenecks, you know, to to open up more and to abate, you're really going to continue to see some of this sticky inflation. And I think that the key here is the demand for durable goods. As we were all locked in at home, we we were doing less in the service industries because restaurants were closed in that, you know, there's been reopenings over the last year, but there's still, a, you know, this de amount of demand is, is really strong right now. And you see that you've got fiscal stimulus from, from the U.S. government that, that fed into people's paychecks and they were getting this extra stimulus. So they're sitting at home, savings from not going out. And that's, you've really seen a surge in demand in durable goods. And so that mismatch between supply and demand have continues to exist today. And until we see some of those supply bottlenecks start to abate, you're going to see that across. And so what we've seen now is a repricing of fixed income, you know, markets. You've seen now that the 10-year treasury shoot up to, you know, near 2% today. You see the front end now, you've seen a lot of movement that it starts to price in Fed hikes. And it's, you know, getting close to one and a half percent on a two-year now, which, you know, back at, you know, September of last year, you're looking at, it was, you know, a little slightly over 50 basis points. So you've really seen some really strong rate moves over the last quarter. Thank you. 
Um, and um, Bethany, may I turn to you now? Um, is, is there a divergence, would you say, in global central banks' approaches? The Bank of England, for example, has um, doubled um, its interest rates to 0.5% very recently. What would you say about this? So among developed economies, I think the response um, and felt inflation has been very similar. Um, it's not a global um, phenomenon, and we see countries like China actually doing completely the opposite and, and loosening um, monetary um, uh, there, whether in the UK, as you said, we've seen already central bank tightening, um, whether things for ECB, we see less dovishness um, from them. Certainly it seems there has been a divergence and we continue to think there'll be a divergence in central bank reaction functions um, and certainly how aggressive um, they have been. And, and what about Europe? How is Europe responding? The ECB, for example? Uh, Europe's probably been one of the most surprising um, stories out there, um, mainly because the structural issues around um, European rates are, are still there. I mean, there have been persistent output gaps and a consistent benign inflationary environment. Um, and these structural headwinds don't necessarily equal higher rates, um, but certainly we've seen recently um, a slightly less dovish ECB um, and the potential for rate hikes in the latter part of the year open up. Thank you. And, and Jason, um, what do you think is the main worry um, right now uh, for the markets? Because the, the markets are nervous in, in, in terms of what's actually happening. Yeah, I mean, I think really what we have right now is the very peak of uncertainty of monetary policy. As you've seen the reaction function with a lot of these central banks reacting to, you know, the, the inflation prints across the globe that are really high, you're seeing a quick pivot to becoming hawkish. You know, as Bethany pointed out, you're even seeing the, the ECB, which has been on hold for, you know, over a decade, turn to be less dovish. And then you've seen like in the U.S. here that the Fed, you know, at, at their meeting last September, they were, you know, 50-50 split between one hike this year. They get to December. Now, all of a sudden, they're at, at three hikes this year. The market is now, after today's CBI print, pricing in six with the possibility of a 50 basis point hike in March. So you've really seen this peak uncertainty of monetary policy start to weigh into markets and you start to see some aggressive rate moves. And I think that's what we're seeing across the globe right now. Thank you. And, and Seth, turning to you now. Um, so we've heard from the government bonds team um, how they are thinking about the current environment. Um, and how they're seeing it. And um, I'm just wondering, how is this impacting you and the credit markets in particular? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's directly impacting credit markets and actually quite aggressively so far. Um, when you think about what's just going on with tightening of financial conditions, wherever they happen to happen, um, whether it be ECB, whether it be uh, BOE, whether it be Fed, um, Ultimately, what's happening is um, money is becoming more expensive. Um, when you think about that from the perspective of lending to companies, uh, money needs to become more expensive. So what's our lever to actually price um, things wider? You move credit spreads. Um, this, it's a very normal, rational move to what's actually happening with tightening financial conditions worldwide. Um, we're just seeing a, a pretty rapid reprice. Um, when you look at um, how just the high yield markets performed in you know 40 days of, of this year, it's been a pretty swift correction uh, down over 3% or so um, after today and after today's tough CPI print will probably be even a little worse than that. Um, that's a pretty swift correction in, in the credit markets when you think about what's actually happening. The interesting part about it is the underlying fundamentals of what's happening behind the companies and their earnings growth that we're seeing we're seeing really little evidence that it's really impacting the bottom line. Um, earnings growth in, in the S&P, just as an example in the U.S., is going to be up, um, you know, low double digits, maybe a nine, maybe an 11. Um, but it's look like, looking like we're going to have um, strong earnings growth. And when you look at the percentage of companies that beat in uh, their Q4 number, it's still pretty healthy. Uh, the real question is, how is this going to start impacting um, cost pressures as we look further into the, the, the next few quarters. And so far, guidance has actually been okay as well. So all of what's happening is rational and makes logical sense. You're starting to see um, a repricing of, of 
you know, the higher cost of money. Um, with that, you have to push credit spreads wider and um, the opportunity for a company to refinance at, at cheaper rates uh, goes away. So right now it's been a, a rational move. Um, I wouldn't describe it as um, something that, that there's any panic. Um, it just seems like a nice um, repricing of risk. And, and so in, in this sort of, I guess, and sort of positive um, picture that you've painted in some ways, do you have any particular sectors that you feel are offering the most opportunity in credit right now? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> when, you're, when you're searching for ideas within the corporate universe, you're really looking for those names that can actually push through their price um, pressures. Um, companies that are, are price takers in this environment might have a more challenging time keeping margins and keeping their, their bottom line growing. So from our perspective, we've been focusing on those sectors that can really push through the price um, while keeping demand high. And some of that is in specialty chemical space where um, you need the ultimate uh, item at the end of the day to make your paint, um, however you wanna, whatever the item happens to be. And, and pricing is just, you can push it through and end up with higher cash flows. I think what we're seeing underneath, um, if you just step, take one step higher from, from sector, and look at ratings, um, it's been interesting to see, particularly in the US, um, higher quality high yield, so double B credits. These are strong, um, fundamentally strong companies that um, default risk is relatively low, um, large market caps usually behind uh, their debt stack. They're underperforming on an excess return basis year to date. A lot of that has to do with just investors' unwillingness to own anything that has interest rate sensitivity. Um, but when I start peak, you know, looking in and, and digging in a little bit, um, if default risk isn't there and you're getting paid a wider spread than you were four or six months ago, and we think this is sort of a short-term situation of where the Fed needs to catch up to an inflationary pressure, maybe it's presenting an opportunity. So less about sector, um, but more about um, rating quality. I think there's an opportunity right now in that higher quality part of the high yield market. Yes. And, and so... It, just considering everything that we've discussed so far between um, all of you, um, would you say this is a, a right time uh, for being an active fixed income manager that makes a real difference? I, absolutely. I mean, I, I think this is the time to be nimble. Um, you know, uh, we, we've seen the issues with some some index products within the fixed income markets and their inability to adapt because they're not they're not designed to do so. Um, when I when I speak specifically about double B's being cheap relative to triple C's, that's exactly what you would expect an active manager to be looking at, um, and then focusing on those sectors that we think can actually grow through this environment. Um, it's not specific to credit. Um, I know uh, Jason and Britt, uh, Bethany would say the same thing about um, global rates. That um, you know, there's opportunities everywhere, and having an active manager to pick your spots is really what uh, you know. What, what we're here for and, and what we really enjoy doing. And, and Jason or Bethany, do you have anything to add to that from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, I said at the outset, the, the, the peak uncertainty of central bank mon monetary policy and some markets priced in very early rate hikes where others were lagging, like maybe the US or the, the RBA in Australia. So there's opportunities there where those dislocations in markets where some rate markets have moved faster than others that maybe they've gone too far. You can, you know, you can receive a little on the front end there, or you can take advantage of, you know, in the U.S. right now with the front end curve really moving, you know, it's flattening quite a bit over the last several months. So there's those opportunities where you see dislocation in rate markets where we, as an active manager, can take advantage of. Thank you. Um... I have a question here that has come in. Um, so um, the question is, um, are you guys worried um, that the more aggressive pace of tightening might be a policy error? And could it choke off recovery? I certainly think that central banks will be at pains to be behind the curve. They're more concerned about falling much, much further behind the curve. Um, so aggressiveness in policy doesn't necessarily mean that they will be aggressive in their policy stance. Um, from the Bank of England's perspective, they have indicated they will be slow and steady um, and that they will give lots of notice ahead of time um, about what those policies will be. Things like quantitative tightening, if we get there, 
um, that will be done at a very slow manner. Um, or just a balance sheet runoff that we're seeing at the moment as gilts mature, that's happening at a slow pace, which is well telegraphed and known to the market ahead of time. Um, I think they will be um, at pains to make sure that they don't um, stress the market too far, saying that um, what has been surprising for me has been that they um, are willing, obviously, to, to raise rates in this inflationary environment at the cost of potentially causing that recession, knowing that de-anchored inflation expectations in the long term are worse off for bond markets. Thank you, Bethany. Um, as we sort of coming up to the um, end of our panel, um, I have one question that I'd have to ask as Director of Fixed Income ESG to anybody on the panel who wants to take it. How do you see ESG considerations, considerations affecting your investment decisions and in your area? And how important do you think they have become? Um, well, for sovereign bonds, um, the relationship between those ESG scores and sovereign credit spreads, um, they are material, but they're not necessarily linear. And um, so we look at countries with strong uh, metrics and they tend to have lower default risks. And um, obviously in global bonds, we look at governance more than anything as this is the most significant factor. But what we're seeing um, is the emergence um, of environmental factors. While it's not an obvious key sort of ESG statistic in, in influencing um, spreads, it, the increased focus from investors means there is risk there um, when we look at portfolios. So we actually have our own proprietary ESG scoring mechanism that we look at and involving in our research with our own sort of top-down view of markets means that we are unable to identify issues ahead of time or um, flag outliers um, as well as spot opportunities in the market that we may not have seen before. Seth, would you? Add to that? Sure. I, I mean, it, very similar to, to what Bethany was saying, that corporate credit market, as investors are becoming more aware and, and cognizant of, of um, having ESG help drive their process, um, we're obviously seeing some implications in, in those, um, you know, historic ESG, um, not violators, if you will, but um, lower scores. And you think about it just from the perspective of the U.S. market, which when you think about U.S. high yield, you know, 15, 16 percent of the market is really going to be some sort of fossil fuel related, directly fossil fuel related, whether drilling or transporting um, the product itself. So um, investors are certainly waking up to it and the ability of these companies to refinance um, in, in the high yield market just specifically has become more challenging. And, and I don't think any of that's going to change. Um, we're going to be a little more um the market as a whole is going to be a little more um, aggressive in forcing some of the companies to to make mandatory changes to actually help improve um, ESG scores, and that's that's something that is um, you know in, in in the multiple years that I've been doing this uh, almost two decades, um, the acceleration that we've seen over just the past few years has been um, quite significant in, in changing investors' perceptions as to how to think about ES, ESG um, in regards to their overall investment portfolio. So. That I do not see that changing um, near term, long term. Um, I think it's here to stay and, and, and rightfully so. Thank you. So this, um, we've come to the end of our uh, panel. I would like to thank uh, the panelists very much for um, a very interesting discussion. Lots of angles we've covered today um, and I will hand over to Lucy now. Thank you. Hey, Natasha, thank you so much. Seth, Bethany, Jason as well great session and yes you covered a lot it was good to see you all and thanks for those contributions